Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Kathy Wiegand, and this is Algoma Boulevard United Methodist Church. Whether we're online or safely back together in person, you are welcome to be with us just as you are, wherever you are. We're so glad that you are with us today. If you'd like more information about ABUMC and all that we do around here, you can visit our website at abumc.org. Every week we send out an email update about what's going on and what's coming up. If you would like to be included in that email, you can send an email to our administrator, Katie, at admin at abumc.org and ask to be added to our email list. Kids, today for children's time, you're going to need a handful of coins. So go get them right now. As we prepare ourselves to be in worship together, to open our lives to the work of the Holy Spirit, hear these words from Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful that you receive us into your presence. It is such a gift and a miracle. Thank you for sharing the light of your glory that we might glimpse your power and majesty. Thank you for sharing your creation with us so that we can see signs of your beauty. Thank you for sharing your son that we might know the depth of your love, forgiveness, and mercy. God, help us each day to be generous in all of your holy ways. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Last week, we started studying spiritual disciplines. They are practices of faith, things that Jesus did. They help us grow in our faith, and they help us be more closely connected with God and with one another. We looked at the importance of service and how serving others is serving God. You are challenged to do two acts of service this week and to share some of those things. And we're grateful for those of you who sent in stories and pictures. We are always looking for ways that we can share your stories in worship and on social media. When we practice service, when we are looking for ways to serve every day, it becomes a more natural part of our lives. When we're looking for ways to serve, they often present themselves to us. Anytime you want to send your stories of practicing spiritual disciplines, you can email me at pastor at abumc.org. In addition to serving and practicing that spiritual discipline, we've also been practicing praying every day at 1230. We know that God has called us through Jesus' great commandment to love God and to love our neighbors. So we read scripture and we pray and we listen and we open ourselves up to the work of the Holy Spirit. We catch a glimpse of how God is calling us as individuals and as a congregation to love and serve in ways that we might never have imagined. If you've experienced any answers to your prayers, let us know so that we can share your stories of faith. Listen again to these words from the Gospel of Mark. Hi, I'm Todd. I'm the music director here at church. I'd like to read Mark 12, 30 and 31. You shall love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other greater commandment than these. Please take a minute and share any prayer requests that you have in the chat. We'll be reading them and uh, praying for you throughout the week. Also take some time to prepare your tithes and your offerings for the week. You can do that by putting a check in the mail, um, or you can do it through electronic giving, and all of the information for that is on our website at abumc.org. As we prepare ourselves for prayer and for giving, we will be seeking God's presence. As we lift our voices in song, our opening song is Be Thou My Vision. Thanks to God for the opportunity to share our prayers together and to give with one another, knowing that as we share our gifts and as we share our prayers, we do it in God's holy presence. The spiritual disciplines of giving and of praying nudge us to live more fully as disciples of Jesus Christ. We give thanks for the moments in our lives where we've noticed God's presence with us. We are so grateful for all the times we've experienced deep joy in our lives. And we lift up our concerns, knowing that God hears us and walks with us always. A few concerns to share today uh, for church family and friends who are facing difficult health, and mental health issues. We especially lift up Jack and Sherry, Sarah and Judy, and also Betty. We also pray for the wildfires out west, for the firefighters who are working tirelessly, and for all of the people who have lost so much. We lift them up in their fear and in their grief. We also pray for our community as our COVID numbers continue to go up. We pray for essential workers, for our teachers, for health care workers, for all of the people that we know about and care about who are going about their daily work out into the world and putting themselves at risk. We know there are other concerns and we hold you in our prayers throughout the week. As we focus our hearts and our spirits in this time of prayer, Let's listen for God to speak. Let's pay attention to where the Holy Spirit is moving. Let us pray. Holy God, everything we have is yours. You experience no shortages. There's no scarcity with you, no lack or deficiency. You share everything with us. You are generous always and unrestrained in the outpouring of your grace. Your mercy is unending. Your love for all people is relentless. Your compassion is unbounded. 
You reveal your truth to us. You imprint us with your image. You illumine our lives with the light of your presence. We are as rich as kings, but so often we live as paupers. Embolden us to grow into the generous people you have created us to be by the power of your spirit who resides within each one of us. And for the sake of Christ and Christ's kingdom, we pray in his holy name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Kids, have you had a chance to go and get a handful of coins. I have this dish that sits uh, at home in my office and it is full of them. So I have a bunch in front of me. I want you to grab one of your coins and look at it really closely. And somewhere on that coin, it's going to say, in God we trust. So you have to look really close, get it way up there, because those words are tiny. If you can't find it, have someone who's with you help you find it. So it says, in God we trust. So in scripture and in church, we talk about trusting God. And we talk about how God has given us so much. It's interesting that the money we use reminds us to trust God. How do we trust God with our money? How do we trust that we can be generous and give to God? How do we do that? I want for us to try something together. Grab your coins. Get a big handful. Do you have them? As many as you can get in your cans, okay? Let's give these coins to God. Are you ready to try it with me? Do you have your handful? We're going to trust that whatever we give to God, God will keep whatever God wants. So, hey, God, we're giving all this to you. Whew. How'd it go at your house? Are they everywhere? I think I still have some in my hair, but it doesn't seem like God kept any of it. Did God keep any of yours? None of yours? Why do you think that is? Maybe that's not how we're actually supposed to do it. Probably God doesn't need money in heaven. More likely, God needs us to use money here on earth and use it as one of the ways that we worship and serve God. When we talk about giving to God, there are so many ways that we can do it. Scripture talks about tithes and offerings. There are two different things, a tithe or an offering. A tithe is a tenth of what we have. So if you have 10 coins, can you count 10 coins? I have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, here's 10 coins in my hand. One tenth of that we give to God. So one of our 10 coins. So if we had $10, we give a dollar of it to God. That is a tithe. And scripture tells us that that's what we should do. Now that still leaves us money for food and for clothes, and God also says in Scripture that that's important. We could also be saving for college or for when we move into our first apartment. Ties are often meant to go to a church so that the church can use the money to do mission and ministry. But gifts, ties and offering, ties and gifts, it's a different thing. Gifts are another thing. They are gifts that we give in addition to our tithes. We give them out of gratitude for all that God has given us. Maybe we give them to church or maybe we give them to charities or to people in need. Our gifts are another way that we can give to God. So here's the thing. God doesn't need to th have us throw our money in the air. 
or spend it in silly ways. God needs us to use our money here on earth so that we can follow Jesus' example to be generous and to be kind and to serve God and to share love. Our coins say, in God we trust, and we trust that God will help us do that well. Amen. Our scripture reading talks a lot about generosity and giving. Our scripture reading is from Paul's first letter to Timothy. Hi, my name is Kelsey Nelson. I'm a high school science teacher, and I'm a member of ABUMC. This week's scripture reading is 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12, and 17 through 19. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus shoring up storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may hold take hold of what is truly life i was recently listening to dak shepherd's podcast and he was interviewing bill gates as part of that conversation they were talking about the giving pledge which bill and melinda and warren buffett started in 2010 I'd heard about it before, but the conversation they had in that podcast taught me a lot. It began in 2010 with 40 of the wealthiest people in the United States, and they committed to giving the majority of their wealth away in order to address some of the most pressing problems in the world. Their goal with that was to start a new standard of giving, a new standard of generosity among ultra-wealthy people. It was and continues to be an open invitation to publicly commit to making a difference in the world. The long-term goal was to shift the social norms of philanthropy among the wealthy and really inspire everyone to pay more attention to giving, giving more, making plans for giving money away sooner in life and to give in smarter ways. Since 2010, significant gifts have gone to help poverty alleviation, refugee aid, disaster relief, global health, education, women and girls empowerment, medical research, criminal justice reform, environmental sustainability, arts, and culture. Today, the Giving Pledge includes more than 200 of the world's most wealthy people, couples, and families. They range, range in age from 30 into their 90s, and globally, they represent 23 different countries. Their website says that joining the Giving Pledge is more than a one-time event. It really means, part, means becoming part of an energized community of some of the world's most engaged philanthropists. One of the things they love about it is that they're all engaged, they're all committed, and they discuss the challenges they've had, the successes they've had, the failures they have, and they share different ways that they can do better jobs of giving. Bill Gates was asked in the interview, is it hard for you to ask people for their money, or does it come easily to you? You can imagine how my ears perked up with that question. 
Bill thought for a second. He said, you know, with the giving pledge, you're not giving me any money. You're just committing that over your lifetime, you'll give the majority of it away which if you have massive amounts, it shouldn't be too hard. He said that because he wasn't asking for the money for himself. It wasn't so hard to ask. In churches for generations, we haven't done a very good job talking about money. But when we look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus talked about money more than he talked about anything else. But for some reason, it seems like it's been considered taboo to discuss it in the church in the most recent years. And many congregations have suffered because of it. Some have died. Giving is central to who we are and how we live out our faith. What if pastors and church leaders held on to that mindset that Jesus had, that it's okay to talk about it? What if they were reminded by Bill Gates that asking for something big for God and for the good of the world shouldn't be that hard? What if we began to ask again, knowing that it's about honoring God, being equipped to do God's work in the world and giving it away so that we can make a difference? I don't think we have any billionaires in our congregation. If I'm wrong, please give me a call this week. Let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Let me know if I'm wrong. But I want you to think about the scriptures that you know about that are about someone giving something. Many of the most powerful stories that Jesus told about money and giving were about people who had very little to give. And they trusted God with everything. Now, I think likely between all of us, we fit somewhere between billionaire and that widow in Scripture who had very little and gave everything. We're all probably somewhere in between. But for Christians, rich or poor or somewhere in between, giving out of what we have has everything to do with Jesus' commandment to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We give so that we can show love to others. And when we're showing love to others, we are showing love to God. But beyond that, we should give because it's necessary for our own spiritual well-being. It's part of the way that we love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Paul wrote about the negative impact that money can have on our souls. And certainly we've heard stories and experienced some of that in our own lives and in our own culture and time. Paul said we should focus our priorities elsewhere. He said, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Our spiritual lives are healthier. Our everyday living is better. When our basic needs are met and our faith is lived out and we are giving well and we are content. When we get focused on money and material things, we are pulled away from what's most important. But we live in a world that runs on money. It was true when the scripture was written, and certainly it is true today. We struggle to have a safe life or a healthy life without money. But The lure of money and the acquisition of possessions can cause distraction and cause harm in our lives. So one of the best ways that we can take that power away from money is to open our hands and give some of it away. I think the most powerful statement that Paul makes in this letter is simply this. Take hold of the life that really is life. 
So many things can distract us from living well, and we can so easily lose track of what's most important and how God has called us to live, take hold of the life that really is life. Paul addressed the Christians of the time who, in the present age, are rich. He told them to not allow the wealth to make them haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Paul said that they and we are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous, ready to share, thus storing up the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. He doesn't say that they should be generous and ready to share because it's good for others, although Paul would likely agree that it is good for others. He said that they should be rich in good works and be generous and ready to share because when they do that, they're living their best lives. They should be generous because it's one of the things that makes us spiritually healthy. I love a good commencement speech, some of the best sermons I've heard. In 2001, Stephen King gave the address at Vassar College, and it is one of my all-time favorites. He was walking down the road one day in 1999, and he was struck and severely injured by a minivan that left the scene. And in his speech, he referred to that accident But he also talked about the earning potential of the graduates that were ready to launch themselves into the world. He said, I'll tell you one thing you're not going to do, and that's take it with you. I'm worth, I don't know exactly how many millions of dollars, and a couple of years ago I found out that you can't take it with you. I found out while I was lying in a ditch by the side of a country road covered in mud and blood with the tibia of my right leg poking out of my jeans. I had a credit card in my wallet, but when you're lying in a ditch with broken glass in your hair, no one accepts MasterCard. We all know that life is ephemeral, but on that particular day and in the months that followed, I got a painful but extremely valuable look at life's simple backstage truths. We come in naked and broke. We may be dressed when we go out, but we are just as broke. And how long in between? Just the blink of an eye. He went on to tell the graduates what maybe they could do in their blink of an eye, what they could do with their earnings, and how they could choose to live their lives. He said, for a short period, you and your contemporaries will wield enormous power. The power of the economy, the power of the hugest military military industrial complex in the history of the world, the power of the American society, you will create in your own image. That's your time and your moment. Don't miss it. But then he added, Of all the power which will shortly come into your hands, the greatest is undoubtedly the power of compassion, the ability to give. We have enormous resources in this country, resources that you will soon enough take command, but they are only yours on loan. I came here to talk about charity, and I want you to think about it on a large scale. Should you give away all that you have? Of course you should. I want you to consider making your lives one long gift to others. And why not? All you want is to get at that getting place, but none of that is real. All that lasts is what you pass on, and the rest is smoke and mirrors. He mentioned a local charity that was doing great work getting money to help the hungry and the sick and the homeless. He told the people gathered that day that he was making a $20,000 contribution to that work, and he challenged the audience to do the same. And then he closed with these words. Giving isn't about the receiver or the gift, but the giver. 
It's for the giver. One doesn't open one's wallet to improve the world, although it's nice when that happens. One does it to improve oneself. He said, I give because it's the only concrete way I have of saying that I am glad to be alive and that I can earn my daily bread doing what I love to do. Giving is a way of taking focus off the money we make and putting it back where it belongs, on the lives that we lead, the families that we raise, the communities that nurture us. Powerful. Who knew that Stephen King could preach? Generosity is a spiritual discipline, which means it's a practice that helps us avoid being superficial in our faith. Someone said that when we present the offering plates each week at the communion table after the collection is taken, the gist of our offertory prayer should be, no matter what else we say or do here this morning, oh God, this tells you what we really think of you. So yes, the church is often asking for money. But we're also often asking you to pray and to be in service, to read the Bible, to confess your sins, to gather in worship. All of those things are good for our souls, and they help us move deeper into living our faith. Last week, you practiced service. Keep working on serving God by serving others as the opportunities present themselves to you. Additionally, this week, begin practicing generosity. Remember, Scripture asks us to be content with what we need, food and clothing and shelter. And probably we should add that saving money for college or retirement or in case of emergency, all important, all good. I'm not asking you to write a check to the church for everything you have. Instead, maybe take some time this week to prayerfully think through your finances. Run your numbers together as a family. Are you giving a tithe, 10% to God through the church? If not, can you take a step forward in your giving or move a little closer to whatever that number is for you? As I said to the kids earlier, our currency says in God we trust. Can we begin to fully trust in God and know that increasing our giving will be beautiful in how we live? Beyond that tithe, are you also giving gifts to God to celebrate God's generosity in your life? Imagine if I gave each one of you $100 right now and you could donate it to any cause anything you would choose, what would it be? Think about it, pray about it, talk about it together. Who would you choose and why? Consider if you could make a gift this week of any amount to something that's important to you. So let's find ways this week to be generous to one another in our service to God. As we said in children's time, God doesn't need us to throw our money in the air. God needs us to use our money here on earth so we can better follow Jesus' example to be generous, to be kind, to serve God, and to share love. Let us pray. Our generous God, you have showered us with your gifts, and we are so grateful. As we embrace you, may our embrace be with arms wide open, ready to share, ready to serve, and ready to love all of your children. God, use our gifts that we may live a spirit-focused life, moving according to the Spirit's touch and bending in the direction of God's holy will. Amen. As we leave this time of worship and prayer and praise today, receive this blessing. Go now into this world 
that is so in need of justice, a community that's so in need of generosity, a life in which you may demonstrate all that is right and good and true, and may God's love surround you, Christ's peace uplift you, and the Spirit's power grant you strength and joy each day. Amen. Our closing song today is Holiness. Blessings on your week. Mm -hmm.